we'd like to be, we have a, a handout. That's a very old fashioned idea, but um, then you can follow what we're saying and you can take it home if you like. Uh, one is the outline of our talk, but the other are URLs um, in this movement and in this field of religion and ecology, which are um, growing quite rapidly. But it occurred to us that we might just want to start also with well, what is religion and uh, that huge topic that no one can quite uh, fill out even in a keyword um, kind of book. But what we want to do is disabuse ourselves here at least um, in, in a book that we're working on in, on ecology and religion that, that religion is associated only with the Western traditions, with monotheism, with belief in God, with salvation uh, and so on. And that's something we haven't quite gotten into in our public discussions on religion. Um, but especially because I study the Asian religions which um, do not have belief in God and, and so on and have a huge emphasis on practice uh, and tradition. And in fact, we were just at a conference at the New School where it was everyday religion in the Himalayas and sustainability and fantastic ethnographic studies on the ground. Um, the other thing we probably need to disabuse ourselves of is this religion and spirituality and religious but not spiritual and, and so on, which I think is, is perfectly legitimate and fine. But it is also the case that religions have contained um, and shepherded and foreground some of the most powerful spiritual traditions on the face of the planet in their mystical traditions uh, and so on. So spirituality is not apart from the religions. But there's a huge movement on nature spirituality right now, which I think is also well worth uh, looking into, even though we won't touch on it in this talk. But I also wanted to bring to bear the fact that um, in our science and, and religion kinds of discussions, it is certainly the case that scientists uh, are deeply inspired by awe and wonder and beauty in terms of nature, Einstein being one of the great uh, spokespersons for that, but I can see some sitting in the audience who I think would say that religion and science, uh, especially in terms of the environment, meet in awe and wonder and beauty, as Tom said so powerfully this morning uh, in his talk. And then um, a final little point here of the introduction about religion, uh, Dale Jameson was good enough to put me in touch with the writings of Ronald Dorkin um, at NYU. And I think one of his statements is, is so rich and valuable, even so he passed away recently, so we're just honoring uh, him, where he says, a religious attitude involves moral and cosmic convictions beyond simply a belief in God that people have an innate, inescapable responsibility to make something valuable of their lives and that the natural universe is gloriously, mysteriously wonderful. And again, I think that's what Tom was touching on this morning, despite the devastation of Ed's extraordinary uh, photos. So finally then, we're saying religion involves a recognition that there's something beyond the human that cannot be named or defined fully, yet calls us to value life both in its material constituents and in its living expressions. Um, that's not to speak to radical transcendence, because as I say, the traditions that I study of Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism are not into radical transcendence. They're into valuing this world. So the return to materiality in the eco-critical world um, might want to look at some of the Asian traditions, which have been there for a very, very long time in terms of hugely valuing um, the world that we live in. So the other thing that we wanted to just say here at the beginning uh, is the varied approaches to the study of religion. And that is, again, in academia, it's kind of, oh, you must be at the divinity school. You must be studying Christian theology and so on. And we've been in and out of a lot of <laughs> divinity schools in our career, um, doing the conferences at Harvard, and then we were out at Berkeley and Yale Divinity School and also Union at Columbia, where I did my graduate studies. Um, now, theology and, and the study of religion are two very, very different things. And faith commitment and training for the ministerial uh, profession, while important, is not the study of religion. And it doesn't as well uh, confine, it, it does not exhaust what we know about religion. So within academia, this is you know, a bit of a contested territory. So religious studies, as we would have it here at Princeton and, and elsewhere, actually draws on many, many disciplines. Hi, Don. 
Um, and it draws on history, it draws on philosophy, clearly the, uh, the compatibility with philosophy and ethics that Dale was talking about, but also sociology and anthropology, this lived religion on the ground. Um, now, religion, and so it's a multidisciplinary discipline, if you will, you see. Um, and uh, of course it has its identity crisis because of that, but it's, it's uh, messy and fun. Um, but religion and ecology, so where did this come from? Um, so it actually, in many ways, it, it preceded the work that we did at Harvard um, with some of the theologians like John Cobb, who in 72, responding to uh, the Lynn White article, wrote, is it too late? Even, even then, and even Gordon Kaufman at, at Harvard wrote some very interesting things about how we have to reimagine God to really attend to these kinds of issues. But my concern uh, for at least reimagining, and this wonderful point about reimagination, was to say that if this is a global crisis of many forms that we're facing around the planet, Environmental ethics are going to look very different in China and India. Those of us as, who were Asian scholars were anticipating that modernity, industrialization, and its tsunami impact on Asia was going to change everything. And so what would environmental ethics look like that was culturally based, grounded in tradition, and so on? So that's why we started these conferences up at Harvard in the mid-90s for three years to kind of survey what are views of nature, what are potential environmental ethics, and so on. So what we like to speak about is this as engaged scholarship. Um, and this is not a sophisticated methodology, but I'm just putting out one form of it, is that we're not saying that just because the Psalms are, are beautiful or because the Buddhist texts talk about interrelationship that there's an environmental ethic you know, implied. But we're trying to say we have to look at these traditions in their texts, in their practice. We have to then uh, reevaluate them and reconstruct. Um, and that is actually what is happening, not just because of this work, but all over the world. I mean, Buddhists in China are rebuilding temples, rethinking what is in ethics and, and Confucianism as well, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But so it's to say all these traditions have always changed over time, um, and that's what they're doing as well at the moment. So there's an emerging field with literally hundreds of scholars doing that kind of work, and there's what we would call a force, which is more the engaged activism. So environmental justice, again, has been quite uh, prominent within the religious traditions and actually was founded there with the UCC tradition and, and so on. So um, that sense of, of activism, Bill McKibben's calling on the religious traditions all the time for his, his work, et cetera. So there's a field within academia and a force uh, engaged in the world. Very briefly, because we know the problems of religion all too well and, and the problems. So, in doing this work, we had to acknowledge, as I would say that almost no other field in the humanities, you see, has to acknowledge what are the problems of religion, because they're visible, they're apparent, they're real in our world. And we're just touching on you know, a few here that many of them can be otherworldly, so salvation, the rapture, and so on, but many of them are deeply committed to this world. And we'll illustrate that with an example from an indigenous tradition and from the Chinese tradition. Um, they also can be very conservative, just like academic institutions, and they can be progressive, like we hope PEI will continue to be. Um, and so we have the movements of abolition led by the Quakers in, in England. We have civil rights led by um, Martin Luther King, and I was deeply involved in that in Washington, D.C. But until the religious communities got involved in civil rights, it wasn't a huge issue. We grew up in an apartheid society. And we can go on with other examples of Gandhi and nonviolence um, and so on. Um, so the continuity and change issue is that, just to summarize these introductory remarks, is that throughout the 5,000 years of, of these traditions, we have a deep sense of this dialectic of tradition and modernity, and the, these pull uh, to the past and the pull to the future. But one of the challenges right now is that 
although we need a, a robust philosophical environmental ethics, as, as Dale knows better than almost anyone, we also need, despite the problems of religion, we need tradition in modernity as a yeasting, as a feckin' force, because if over 85% of the world's people are religiously affiliated, we can't ignore that in our environmental studies program or in the world at large. So that's, um, that's part of it, but it's not just the pragmatism of there's a billion Muslims, there's a billion Catholics, there's a billion Hindus, there's a billion Confucians and so on. So E.O. Wilson said to us up at Harvard, of course we need those religions, let's get them on, on board, you see? But my invitation here in terms of the, the environmental humanities is it's not just instrumental, it's not just use of these traditions and so on. It's really understanding what, is the, what are the dynamics, what's the juice here, what has had traction for people for many, many years. And that is spiritually transforming, ethically engaging, uh, and so on. So with that, we'll turn it over to John. It's interesting to see in the study of religion the variety of views of nature that surface in such a, a rich study. I'm thinking immediately of the work of Clarence Glacken and his traces on the Rhodian shore, which would be the first footnote in any discussion of views of nature, say, in the West. But I look forward to the student who will undertake the work that uh, Clarence Glacken and Peter uh, Coates uh, did in the Western context, let's say, in uh, South Asia. Views of nature in South Asia, views of nature in East Asia, views of nature among Pacific indigenous people. So these are rich possibilities on the horizon for graduate studies in the environmental humanities from the standpoint of religion. If I would just open up a few of them for the uh, a point of illustration here, consider, uh, consider Judaism. Uh, I have on this sheet, uh, goodness, uh, Hebrew Bible, banishment from garden. Uh, let's take the banishment from the garden first because historically it's probably one of the older sources, the Adam and Eve source uh, generally attributed to the Yahweh's tradition in the Bible, agricultural herding, and uh, views of nature that are embedded in that particular text uh, certainly rate the hu human, Adam, to the soil. So it's a very strong agricultural view of nature. But then if we go to the uh, the goodness verses in the opening uh, sections of Genesis. This is post-exile in Babylon. This is a, a re tradition returning to Jerusalem in which the need for a cosmology that firmly establishes the people in their region signals this by the goodness of creation, the orderliness of creation. And then that very interesting verse in Genesis uh, 1.26 the dominion verse where human is given dominion over the earth and there's a lot of revisiting of that view of nature from a human perspective. Just to continue briefly in Judaism, think for a moment of uh, the emergence of uh, Pharisaical Judaism prominent in the New Testament where Jesus is interacting with the uh, Pharisees and the, um, the Qumran material that we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in that Qumran material is a text called uh, Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice. I had such a wonderful experience with a rabbi at the NYU uh, to go through that text. And he was interested in my perspective as a scholar of indigenous traditions. Where were the points of reference? Of course, this is a community who has been ousted from the temple. So where is their environmental concern? Think of it, songs. Sabbath, sacrifice, the ecological imaginary that is embedded in these texts of a people who are undertaking ascetic activities in order to place themselves in their tradition. So Judaism holds all of these rich and very interesting uh, perspective on views of uh, nature within the tradition. Uh, moving into the emergence of uh, Christianity, and I signal it with uh, Catholicism in the Protestant tradition and orthodoxy here. Um, if we would consider the sacramental tradition in Catholicism, which becomes again a, a breaking point with the Protestant tradition, the sacramental tradition, the sense of a material reality being able to make present the sacred, 
I don't think that could happen in Christianity without uh, in, uh, the incarnation, without a sense of uh, the divine reality being taking flesh. Huh? So a view of nature through this whole incarnational person of uh, Jesus and Nazareth. How will that express itself later on? Very different view of nature, say in the person of Francis of Assisi, whom Lynn White mentioned earlier. Uh, Lynn White would position Francis of Assisi as the uh, patron of the ecological movement. Well, does Francis have uh, the same view as in early Christianity? I would say not so. I mean, historically it's obvious. But what's the view of nature that's in being informed here? The, Francis's Christological view of nature is the Christ component within all of reality, which again, it's a quite old in the tradition. John's Gospel speaks of the Logos. But here we have Francis of Assisi dancing the Christological view, his view of nature, the performative character of it, the, the Christological center of all reality. So within this tradition, the, the richness of images that are emerging uh, in the Protestant tradition, the unmediated character of the believer in relationship to the utterly transcendent and sublime divine. Uh, if we have one contribution from the Protestant tradition, and there are so many, but one that we can't ignore at all because it's already arrived on the screen several times today, is the sublimity of the natural world. The sense of that transcendent axis, which the Protestant tradition moves into an utterly divine, suddenly there is an inversion, if I could draw on that, Ed, this inversion where the sublime is situated in the natural world. So we see in these religious traditions views of nature that are themselves changing but also become radically altered, subverted and uh, inverted uh, in the tradition. Uh, just to ma make a few comments about uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, I have um, uh, dualism and non-dualism uh, on the sheet and it uh, provides an interesting moment to reflect on the uh, the uh, colonial view of so-called Hinduism as a Upanishadic, the great uh, textual tradition of the Upanishads, where the oneness of Brahman is asserted with such strength. And yet uh, we know now within the diversity of this tradition we call Hinduism that there are strong non-dual uh, elements, that there are the sense of the uh, individual in relationship, the, uh, the Atman of the individual in relationship to this uh, unific Brahman. Uh, and so uh, Hinduism and its uh, great devotional traditions. Uh, similarly with uh, Buddhism, the uh, sense of uh, nirvana as uh, a reality to which uh, all, uh, all of us move towards inevitably but there, there is no abiding oneness, that there is no abiding being, no permanent being in Buddhism. And yet what is it that moves towards this nirvana reality? So within uh, Buddhism itself, there are these very interesting reflections, views of nature on the individual in relationship to nature. And just to make a final comment, uh, the sense uh, in Buddhism of the collective. Where is the collective good? in Buddhism, if it's if individuals that are moving towards nirvana, and if the world around us, this world of suffering and change, is eventually identified in Buddhism as itself nirvana. So the views of nature are shifting in Buddhism, individuals moving across that shore towards Buddhism, and now I think today an effort to understand the collective uh, in Buddhism, a sense of very new development within this tradition, and I think it has strong environmental implications. Uh, in that sense, all of these traditions uh, show to us a particular uh, engagement with the natural world that we're calling religious ecologies. Yes, and I think what we're trying to illustrate in this, that part of the talk is that even in Christianity, there's such a variety within the different sects of Christianity. We didn't mention the evangelical sect, which is actually moving forward on certain aspects of climate justice and so on. Um, but the variety of these traditions in their present engagement, as well as their historical change, is something we really have to be attentive to. Um, so. Uh, and that's what the Harvard 
uh, conference books actually um, make that available. But also on our website, I should just point out, there are statements of all the world's religions. We forgot to put the URL there, but if you Google religion and ecology, you'll find it. So there's statements from all the world's religions on the importance of nature and the value of it, all of this being developed pretty much in the last 10 to 15 years, and uh, projects on the ground. Um, so we also help make a a film called Renewal, which is eight case studies of religious grassroots environmentalism in North America. Um, so again, it's between this theory and praxis. Um, and the website has a lot of, um, all the literature has been annotated um, in this field. And so scholars are beginning to move forward in, in uh, studying it. But so our approach, um, has a deep sense, and in part thanks to our teachers, Thomas Berry and uh, Ted DeBerry at Columbia and uh, Duwei Ming at, at Harvard, um, had a very profound sense of the way that religions worked, as I say, not just in a conventional sense. And that was that these are cosmologies and they all have ecological components. So um, what we're saying in, in this section that religious ecologies, um, it's a new term, but that they're ways of orienting humans to the universe, grounding them in the community of nature and society, nurturing them within Earth's seasonal processes, and transforming them in relation to their cosmological selves. So this sense that we used actually for the first time in our course here at Princeton in the fall, that there's these four components to religious ecologies, that it's orienting humans to the cosmos, that it's grounding humans on the earth, uh, that nurturing through food, water, and so on, and transforming humans through ethical practice, uh, spiritual cultivation, and so on. So this actually also corresponds to the elements with orientation being the air, earth grounding, water nurturing, and transforming fire. Uh, and the students, um, I see Divya back there, and the students actually found this to be very rich, as are the Yale students right now, because it shifts our understanding of what is religion. How does it actually function for people? And I'm not saying this is you know, unific, this is the only way to see it, but it is, especially with many of the world's religions, such as indigenous traditions and traditions of Asia, um, that these have oriented people, and that's what the conference in uh, New York at the New School, the, the Himalaya region is all about these everyday religious practices from Hinduism and Buddhism that are grounding people um, in their bioregion. Um, the sense of cosmology, you know, we've lost that sense of cosmology to um, largely to science and to, in fact to some of the most extraordinary scientific studies right here at, at Princeton on the early universe uh, and so on. But cosmologies were largely the province of religious traditions for most of human history. The story, um, again to Joni's point, how do stories orient, move us, give us that sense of where we've come from, why we're here, where we're going. Big questions, late night questions for students in their dorms. Um, so this sense that myths and the symbolic stories of the origin of the world, the unfolding of life, and human participation in the community of Earth and humans is what, um, what religions have done. And it's one of the reasons why we made this film, Journey of the Universe, to say that we now have the possibility of bringing together the best of modern science from astronomy um, through the formation of planets, geology, uh, chemistry, biology, botany, and so on. We have this richness of the sciences and we can tell it as a story out of which we have emerged and come. Um, and that, so that sense of the, the conjunction of religion and science is uh, moving into, a, I think, a new and fresh phase as we repossess that notion of cosmology and ecology. So we're going to just give two examples of how this works from an indigenous tradition in the Pacific Northwest, the Salish people, um, in both British Columbia and Washington State, and then something from the Confucian uh, tradition that I study most in East Asia. So to, to even theorize this example of a, a Native American uh, ceremonial, I think of uh, narrative and performance as two approaches that this field, uh, the study of religion and ecology and the broader uh, consideration of environmental humanities, 
there's a sense of uh, a question. What are people narrating in this ceremonial? And what is it that they're performing? Uh, one way that I found uh, a, a phrase that tags for me what this uh, theoretical uh, approach uh, opens up is to return to the old uh, discourse of uh, world religions. That it used to be, and I think of it as world apostrophe s religions, the world's religions. Well, how did one become a world religion? In other words, this Salish winter dance, uh, will we find them at the table when we do uh, interreligious dialogue? And I think any of you who are aware of those kinds of dialogues up until the 70s, they were not. Indigenous people were not asked to sit at that table. And now what is it? What's made the difference that we find uh, elders from indigenous traditions invited to interreligious dialogues? I think part of it is the shift in the discourse of world's religions. It's no longer the universalizing traditions that were meant for everybody, but rather religions that are in the world. There is no religion that people don't take up in their hands. There's no religious practice that people don't do standing on the earth. So world religions now is religions in the world. And again, the shorthand on that from in my, our way of thinking is uh, religious ecologies. It's kind of questions we're asking. How do they act in the world? Religious cosmologies, how do they narrate? So the example that um, Mary Evelyn mentioned of the uh, Okan Okanagan people in eastern Washington state, um, they uh, hold at this time of year from December until uh, March uh, winter dances. And these are held by uh, healing personalities who have the privilege of songs. So songs have come to them from the local landscape, biodiversity or places in the landscape. Uh, and these songs then are sung in a community setting. So the room would be, say, uh, a third or half the size of this in a large uh, uh, setting. The winter dance that I've uh, attended in Mary Evelyn, I've gone to since 1985 in the little town of, uh, in Salish, Nashliam, where the stream coming out of the Selkirk Mountains, where it hits the Columbia River, Nashliam. It's now in Shaliam. They have a ferry that crosses the FDR Lake backed up behind the Grand Coulee Dam. So all of the signs of human manipulation of their colonial interaction are right there at this winter dance. But what, what is this ceremonial? Disappeared from these people in their tradition and then the old man, uh, Martin Louis, came back in 1978. He came back home to die. And while he was there in his 80s, uh, he and his boys, they thought they would reinitiate this winter dance a time when you put up the lodgepole pine from the floor to the ceiling, and that becomes the old man, the old woman, around which the world moves. And you and I, and all of us attending the dance, we sit around the edges, and those who have songs, at a particular point, they'll stand up. It goes from eight in the evening till nine the next morning or so. They'll stand up, those who have songs, and everyone else will quiet up. They'll prepare themselves and they'll walk to the pole and they'll sing very slowly their song four times. They'll take the pole and they speak then of this uh, song that they have coming out of the world. Their relationship with this song, their kinship with this song, this sense of what has been given to them. And they'll talk about what's happened during the year in the community. So the ethics, the, the community ethics, that's being manifested at this moment is very obvious. People are rehearsing all of the issues here. As they then uh, finish talking to the community, they begin to sing that song in a very fast mode. And you and I get up and we dance uh, clockwise around them, that person at the tree, and we are all the animals in movement. So this uh, performance of the, the world here uh, around this cosmic tree, by virtue of the songs that are given by those beings in the landscape. So the relationships that are established here in and among a community and with the natural world, they certainly are performed. It's, uh, I'm even trying to suggest that to you in my language. But uh, as well, there's a cosmological narrative underlying all of this. Because those beings in the landscape, they were here before we as a human community were here. 
And they made our being possible. They made our community possible because they gave to us and they continue to give to us, say this tradition. They give to us of their bodies. And so when these songs are given to a person, the individuals who have them also experience a sickness in this season of the winter dance. It comes over them, a kind of a malaise, a kind of a dis-ease, and singing at the winter dance lifts it. But the singing, the spirit sickness and the singing are all in relationship to these beings in the landscape. Uh, empathy, a participation in their giving of their bodies, the fact that we eat them, uh, and now we have this capacity to renew our, our uh, community. You didn't go into spirit sickness fully, did you? <laughs> no, pick it up. Go ahead, take it up. <laughs> um, well, no, I just think uh, the sense, you know, that religion isn't just all, uh, all beauty and light and so on, that they understand the psychological power of living in the depth of winter in conditions that are not easy for survival. And so what does it mean for a community to renew itself in, in a sense of, I mean, those of you who live in Colorado know about this a bit more, but um, so the sense of a spirit sickness in coming across even young people at an early age, again, I think we know a lot about that in our own society, but here are rituals that we're actually attending to that sensibility of isolation, of aloneness, of, of confusion, um, of longing um, uh, uh, in the depths of winter. So when you go to this, uh, I've only been once with Johnny, he's been many more times, but it is absolutely powerful to see a community that is itself um, very compromised, you know, in terms of economic stability and so on and so forth, as so many of these reservations are, but they are keeping alive um, traditions and rituals that actually bond families, bond generations, and so on. Again, imperfectly, and so on. That's the messiness of this. But it's a very powerful sense that one song carries one through and out of the, those depths of confusion, of, of sadness, and so on, into celebration. And celebration in particular, because it's the food that renews. When John first got an understanding of this, which took many, many years, um, and that what they were dancing for was that the snow would cover the root crops so that the root crops would feed the deer and the whole cycle of things. Those root crops, which they brought into the ceremony in very special ways and honored along with water, you know, it's this huge connection to what nurtures life. Very, very powerful. And that's true for the Sundance, too, which John has been much involved with, with the Crow people in Montana. Again, conditions of, of poverty and, and so on that are extraordinary, but every summer there are Sundances across the, the high plains, and they are dancing not just for their tribes and their people, but for the world. These are world-renewing rituals um, at great sacrifice. So, I wanted uh, to come now to a very different part of the world, but a world that, of course, Ed uh, gave us a glimpse into with, uh, with his extraordinary pictures of China and his manufacturing landscapes really was so powerful to me and, and I've used it um, in my own teaching. Um, because China and, of course, India are sh reshaping our planet. But since I have studied East Asia uh, more, uh, although I've been to both places um, for the last 35 years many, many times. But I want to just share with us here um, a tradition that's not well known, um, barely studied in fact, and that is Confucianism. That I want to, of course, say first, when you look at, at the Chinese tradition, the historical landscape, it's always three traditions are one, which is a term from the Ming, but these always um, it was syncretic. It's not the three traditions are separate, like the Abrahamic traditions, okay? So in Japan, you are raised actually in a Shinto ritual. You uh, might have a, a uh, Christian and, and or a Shinto marriage term, but you're always bur buried as a Buddhist, all right? And your ethics for your family and the society are deeply Confucian. So, Confucianism is the ethical system that extends all across East Asia, China, Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam, and so on, are all in the sphere of Wa, 
which means harmony. Um, now, but it's also to say Confucianism and Taoism have interacted over time uh, hugely. And it is also to pick up one of the points of when I was talking about cosmology and ecology. These are systems um, of what we would call the micro and the macro. This dance between the human and the larger spheres of life. Uh, so the, the very first point here, um, well, let me, before I go into this micro and macro, let me just say that this is not just an academic study. This is what's so fascinating about what's happening in China, of which I'm giving you a, a very small uh, window into a huge and complex society. But the fact of the matter is, is that in China right now, both with the past president, Hu Jintao, and the present president, there is a movement towards creation of what they are calling ecological culture. Okay, ecological culture. Now, culture has a huge resonance in China, being a 5,000-year-old civilization. Sometimes it's translated as ecological civilization. But they are saying, um, on the government level, and the pre last pre this present new president mentioned it 15 times in his speech in the fall at the National Car Congress Party, that we must create an ecological culture. Because they know they are drowning in their waste of every kind. There are 66,000 protests a year in China alone on the environment. You know, it's, it's really off the charts. And we can talk about that in, in the discussion session. But um, in 2008, we met with the vice minister for the environment, Pan Yue, who himself, for the last 12 years, has been studying, he actually has a history of religion degree. Do you believe that? And he had been looking at these traditions of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism for their um, views of nature and potential for an environmental ethics in China, which was just extraordinary. So our meeting was, you know, quite, quite an exciting moment because they've translated these books of, that we did at Harvard on Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism into Chinese. And they are looking for what will their environmental ethic look like. And he said, you know, we have all these power plants that are going up all over the place, way out in Mongolia. We can't control them. We don't have an environmental uh, and ecological culture. So he's bringing in musicians and, you know, a whole range of things to try and develop this. But let me say, um, so I've got government, academic, and popular. So this, the, within this ecological culture, a revival of Confucianism is also taking place, which is extremely interesting. And this is partly because, of course, it's a hugely materialist society. Um, you know, it's hyper-materialism, so the spiritual vacuum of all kinds of sorts, and, um, and a lot of, of um, sadness among the young people because they don't see what their future is amidst this uh, tsunami of materialism. So in addition to the government encouraging ecological culture, they are also encouraging uh, revival of Confucianism. They have now set up Confucian um, academic societies. There's one at Rutgers. There's about 25, like an Alliance Francaise so that the understanding of Confucianism and Chinese culture will be better understood abroad, but as well they've done it within uh, China. The academic world has had a huge number of conferences um, in the last 12 years on the early Confucians, the later Confucians, its implications for today, and so on. And most of the philosophy departments are fed up, I shouldn't say, this out loud, I suppose, but many of them are quite bored with Marxism as the party line and looking towards um, this revival of Confucianism as part of their tradition. And Duwei Ming, who we studied with uh, hugely and was very helpful to our project at Harvard, is back at Beijing University heading up an institute for the humanities precisely as a counterpoint to a hyper-science technology mentality and trying to bring humanities and humanistic thinking and the tradition uh, back into their premier university. So on a popular level as well, um, this one woman who is a sociologist at a university and also a journalist wrote a book on Confucius several years ago. And she's not an expert or anything, but she wrote a book. Ten million copies were sold. How does that sound for, for an academic book? So people who are buying it up, she's a phenomenon. She speaks them all over TV about what are the values of, 
of Confucian uh, ethics and, and so on and so forth. So my point is, this is not just an academic study that's sort of of interest um, for, for us at a distance. It's quite, again, I, I don't want to overstate it, but it's, it's a vibrant and real movement in China on these various levels. So very briefly, why would it be vibrant uh, in China, and why might it also have something to say even here? And I can say every time I do Confucianism in my classes, uh, doesn't matter where, the students absolutely love it. And I'm not saying that this is not a system that also had political autocracy, views of women, that all the world's religions uh, had, had this problem. So I'm not trying to say this isn't a tradition without its dark side. But if we look at what the tradition is actually saying, um, it's quite rich, quite um, exciting, actually. So, and we could, I could talk for the next half hour on, is it a religious system, is it ethical, is it uh, political, um, and is it a social system? It's all of the above. And one of the efforts in my own scholarship is to show how this is a spiritual, ethical, philosophical tradition, very different from our own, but very vibrant, and so on. So, what is it? It's this micro, macro, this concentric circles that the human is not isolated. There's no sense of hyper-individualism. There's a sense of communitarianism, which again, has its positive and negative dimensions, but that we are contained within the circles of our family, friends, friendship is hugely important in the Confucian world, um, the larger educational world, huge values of education and cultivation, the society, politics, nature, and the cosmos itself. And this is a unitary world, which is, as Du Wei Ming has called it, this sense of a continuity of being. So there's not radical transcendence of a god or something outside this process. It is a dynamic, organic, holistic, relational worldview, which has a lot of complementarity with Whitehead, actually. And at Claremont, John Cobb, a Whitehead scholar, has um, started a whole connection to China where there's about 25 centers now for the study of Whitehead and, and Confucianism as well. So it's a fascinating uh, emergence of this cross-cultural study as, as, as well. So finally, then, what is the human role amidst this dynamic, transforming, organic uh, worldview? This is something that's been a great inspiration to me since my graduate studies at Columbia. And that is, and we've touched on it in so many of the talks, I think, but these human nature relations, how do we affect the natural world? As Joni was saying, how does the natural world affect us in metaphor or in reality? Um, one of the great texts called The Doctrine of the Mean says that humans complete this triad, and it's symbolically, it's heaven, earth, and human, but again, it's not heaven up there. It's heaven as a powerful guiding force, a natural order of things, if you will, so infused throughout the natural world that we can understand because we have a nature that's also lit up by this sense of an order and a harmony in the natural world. So humans complete this triad of what they would call the 10,000 things, the fecundity of life, and the cultivation of the human is in relationship to that fecundity and the principles within the natural world. Um, so this is what Du Ming has called an anthropocosmic worldview, not an anthropocentric worldview. And I think it gets us out of this dualism or this problem um, that it resituates us, as many of the world's religions have done, that we are anthropocosmic beings, um, that we've come out of this universe, as we know now scientifically. But this text, just to maybe um, conclude on, on this note, and have John have, have the final word, um, is that it's not only that we are affected by these, the great seasonal cycles, by the power and mystery of forests and, and water, um, and fish, and birds, and so on. We are profoundly affected by this. We know this. Those people who can take us out into nature and guide us like Henry even deeper understand this power. But this particular text also says we affect the transforming and nourishing powers of heaven and earth. 
So it says we are affected by these transforming and nourishing powers, but we also affect them. Um, and that dialectic, not just in the destructive side that, that Ed uh, pointed out so powerfully, but I think our challenge is it's, it's not just can we reset that ancient relationship. Uh, we have to reset something in a new context, but that huge sensibility that we're affected by and we affect the transforming and nourishing powers of heaven and earth, I think has something very powerful uh, to offer us. John. I think when one has a, uh, a, a taste of that uh, transforming and nourishing power, you begin to see uh, how religions can uh, come together themselves and dialogue about environmental issues. That it has the environmental issues have the capacity to bring peoples together to address these problems. At the Islam and Ecology Conference at uh, Harvard in 97, uh, we were told it would be very difficult to bring together representatives from the various branches of Islam, but non nonetheless they came. And this gathering of some 135 people, there was a moment in that conference where you could see the power of this issue in religion and ecology, this particular effort to uh, draw together the discussion around the environmental problems and how did this tradition, what did it have to say to these problems? That uh, the speakers from the Sunni tradition, when they heard a, a, a architectural student at MIT who was sponsored by the Aga Khan Foundation and he was describing a, a Islamicized indigenous people in South Asia who were uh, addressing uh, during the Ramadan feast a particular uh, deity and uh, had that deity and were immersing the deity in the water. So it was this obviously a syncretic sect. And the Sunni participants in this conference stood up and they yelled, shirk, blasphemy. And four or five of them, they went to the back door and they yelled, they yelled there at the speaker. But they didn't leave. They didn't leave. And that conference went on. And that sense of uh, what draws people, even out of these orthodoxies or fundamentalisms, what will finally bring religion to the table in this issue, is uh, as many of the issues we've seen today. We don't want to go extinct. Um, we do not, <laughs> and that was Tom's point, and we want to open it up to discussion, but I wanted just to tie it back to, uh, to Dale's talk as well, which I really appreciated, and, that, and the question that Shauna asked, and that is um, between the management ethos and the moral valuing, you know, because all our sustainability programs would say we're trying to do the right thing and put it into action, but one of the things that I do think this, this ethics and worldviews and, and different world religions um, might offer, and it's not to say I really agreed with, with Dale's point and I found it very important that you know, we don't have that one thing that's going to change the conversation from the moral, ethical, spiritual side, I think. But um, the, the sense, I think what we're saying here at the very end, that we're simply trying to point to other ways to value nature beyond the economic that ecosystem services is a fabulous uh, cost-benefit analysis as far as it goes and we understand where... Probably it, necessary. Yes, very necessary but not sufficient. And um, I think that sense is what the environmental humanities yeah. need to enter into exactly. that discussion. You see, our school is dominated by ecosystem services, that we're going to measure the value of these wetlands or mountains because they give us water and, and so on and so forth. But there's something beyond the economic valuing. And I think our collective challenge is from literature and history and ethics and the arts um, is to find a language that articulates uh, what that is, that builds on, of course, the Muirs and Pinchots and so on, but goes beyond. And so, you know, I'm just saying here at the end, from resource to source, this is a source of life. And as Leopold said beautifully, from commodity to community. So that's the transformation, I think, that we're into. And um, I'm very inspired by the work and, and the talks we've heard today that 
I think we can do it, but we can only do it collectively. And I want to thank not only the, the Barron family, but also Bert Kurtzstetler, who has pushed us in this direction um, for a long, long time. So let's end with a sense of applause from those from the outside who are really pushing us in, the Barons and the Berts. <laughs> At this particular moment in my life, Tom, I feel the uh, coyote uh, diver story appeals to me a lot, and it has been that way for some time. Among, it's a circumpolar creation story in which the trickster hero coyote is in a craft after the great flood, so there's this sort of resonance with, among so many traditions of heavy influx of water, and uh, the effort is to uh, recreate, so it's a creation story and the animals go down. So it's a reverencing of animals right away. It's uh, coyote is in a human form, but it's the animals who go down and get the water. And it's finally um, one of the more insignificant animals, but generally one that tr uh, crosses between water and land, lives effectively on both. And uh, muskrat, say for example, or beaver, they come up with this little grain of soil and it's, uh, it's spread out. And that sense of uh, spreading out also, or of uh, walking out, uh, is, uh, I find, very appealing in terms of the work to be done. Yeah. Can you imagine how much fun it is to be living with a trickster, a coyote? <laughs> um, I'm so fortunate to have John uh, to do this work with. And so, and, you know, my... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's funny, actually, Fred Mote, a great uh, historian of China here um, at this university, who passed away, but he was one of the people who identified that the Chinese actually don't have a creation story. And that always intrigued me. I mean, of course, there's Pangu and, and so on, but Mote was really pointing out something that's unique, I think, to the Buddhist world as well, would say, this is ongoing. You see, there wasn't the Big Bang, or there wasn't this origin moment. And that is a mind-boggling sensibility. You know, it's just so, so different and absolutely intrigued me. Um, and it's partly why this, this fecundity and the transformation and the sense of change that comes out of, especially the Confucian and Taoist tradition, is so fascinating to me. Because it's part of the sense of affirming change, not withdrawing from it, as, as in a Buddhist um, you know, tradition. But let me also just say, um, I think our best, I don't like to use creation story you see, fully because it's so locked into the Abrahamic tradition, but our best stories of or story of origin is coming from science now. But it has to be told with metaphor, with a sense of the power of science reorienting us in a universe that is 14 billion years old. This is astounding. And even listening to Lyman Page and some of these great scientists saying 20 years ago, we didn't know if it was 15 billion or 12 billion. We have it at 13.7. I mean, these discoveries, though, are so extraordinary and so exciting. But we need to be able to tell it from the biological level to the geological level to the astronomical level in a way that it's accessible to humans. And I think that's our most powerful story that we have. 
And that's partly from you know, our teacher, Thomas Berry, too. So I don't want to claim anything original here, but let's yeah. go with the sciences. <laughs> That's a great question, and I only touched on it lightly when I said, um, just to your point, that these traditions, especially in East Asia, are very rich with their views of nature. But traditional China, um, I think it's more a little more mixed, even though people like Mark Elvin and so on have also documented this, as you've pointed out. But so one part, the historical environmental history needs to, you know, be more fleshed out because it's so huge. But I would say that this was a tradition that was, I mean, the irrigation works, for example, in Sichuan that are still working 2,000 years old. This was a, a society deeply committed to an agricultural system that would feed large numbers of people. You know, so on, on that level of ecology, which is agriculture and food, they did pretty well. I mean, you can say, was the Grand Canal a good idea, and, and, and so on and so forth. But I think the modern, so the past, I think, is mixed, and I take that to be true for around the world, you know, slash and burn agriculture and if indigenous peoples and, and so on and so forth. But I think the question in, in the modern period is really uh, very important, and that, that is to say a couple points. One is, for 10 years in the Cultural Revolution, this tradition was completely deconstructed, uh, 70, uh, up to you know, 66 to 76. Massive, virulent destruction. But that started even with the May 4th movement um, in the early part of the 20th century. There's no tradition on the planet that probably deconstructed itself more rapidly than Confucianism because of the power of the West and technology and so on. And so, this backtracking, how can we learn from the West? So the deconstruction of the tradition, Mao was adamant that it must be deconstructed so we could move forward. So what you have, of course, on the mainland were some older scholars, like from Yulan and so on, who kept it alive. But the tradition was actually kept alive in Taiwan and Hong Kong, the Academy of Seneca and so on, by about a dozen scholars, up to, you know, in twice that. This is one of the most amazing stories of, I think, how a tradition is kept alive and then re-delivered, if you will. And Duwei Ming and De Berry have been hugely important about that. But finally, I do think this isn't uncritical, and I think the academics will bring that, that more critical voice to bear. Sorry, I get going on this. I can't lose the opportunity, though, to just point out uh, Carl Popper in the audience, he and his wife, Deborah, is that right? Uh, have worked on the Buffalo Commons idea. Frank, Frank, Frank thanks, Frank. And uh, also Don Carl Hughes. Carl Zarello. <laughs> Carl Zarello. <laughs> And uh, Don Hughes' work uh, on Native American environmental thought reminds me that there has been that uh, attention to uh, Native peoples also as having uh, degraded uh, their environments. And the question arises then, does that e eliminate uh, any consideration of indigenous or Native peoples as having a contribution to this question? Whereas I think it's uh, both and. We, we have examples of buffalo jumps where native people ran animals off of cliff, but we also have uh, s numerous examples of intimacy of exchange with bioregions that's transmitted in terms of indigenous knowledge. So it's not simply an either or a response to that question in terms of indigenous people. 
Okay, so, so your question is more complex than, than the words, <laughs> um, and, uh, and I thank you for it. And I think, I mean, one, Du Wei Ming, okay, a great Confucian scholar who taught here and at Berkeley and then uh, 20 years at, at Harvard, and one of the things that inspired us to do this survey over three years of the different world religions and views of ecology and, and do these volumes, um, was because he wrote a very powerful piece in, I think in the 80, mid-80s, and it was called Beyond the Enlightenment Mentality. And what he was saying is that we need, clearly, the views and values that have been given from the French Revolution, from modernity, of individualism, of democracy, um, of certain freedoms, and so on. And, and the rest of the world is, is yearning for this. You know, what's the Arab Spring about? Um, if not this yearning for freedom and democracy and liberty. So what Dewey Ming said, and I think in a very balanced way, he said, you know, let's take the best of modernity, but he also said liberty, equality, and fraternity. Maybe we haven't done so well on fraternity, you see, in the West. And so perhaps we have to look to cultures such as indigenous traditions, I think African-American traditions, Confucian traditions, which have had communitarian values. And that's, that's true before, rabid modernity, shall we say. So he would say we need a corrective and a complementarity, but we also need a sense of how all the world's cultures and religions and values are contributing to a new sense of modernity. And his term, traditions in modernity, he was very involved with De Berry in, in human rights, bringing um, the Asian traditions to that discussion, as well as this discussion of ecology and religion. So it's reconfiguring modernity, and I would say not just for sustainability, but for the flourishing of the planet. You know, we don't want this relationship to be just sustainable. We want it to be flourishing. <laughs> and that is what I think this reconfiguration is about identifying the problems and the promise all along. And by the way, one good thing Mao did was empower women. So that's a reconfiguration. Um, so I think it's this invitation to flourishing. We need to do it in conjunction with science, and we need to find the metaphors um, that will light up humans uh, beyond despair and disempowerment. And I think that's what this conference is doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you.